Hello, I'm Dr. Daniel Griffin. And I'm Dixon DePomia. And today we're going to be discussing abdominal pain. Ha. Huh. <laughs> now I know right before we started, you were saying abdominal pain, stomach pain, what's the difference? I did say that. Should, we, should we talk about that? Would you please? <laughs> <laughs> Let's clarify this. <laughs> When I first went into practice, I had a friend who had grown up in Alaska. And Alaska is a state very far north. It's actually the other side of Canada. So it it's, is. it's <laughs> very far north. Part of it's up in the Arctic Circle. Yep. He'd grown up there and we trained together in the western part of the United States. But then he went up to Alaska. And um, early on, we were talking. I used to go up there every year. And he said, you know, Dan, when I'm examining someone's, um, what do I call it? Do I call it? <laughs> the abdomen? Do I call it the belly? Do I call it the stomach? And I realized that there's often a disconnect between the language that you're taught in your true. medical training and the language that people oh, use. That's exactly right. And so when someone says, I have my stomach hurts, yeah. my belly hurts, right. not a lot of people come in and say, I have abdominal pain. No. Right? They don't. They do not <laughs> say that. That's so, a generalized term, I think. <laughs> so it becomes important for us to, um, to understand. And some of the patients we might be seeing don't use English as their first language. Right. So it may be, uh, may be a term in another language. And our job as a clinician is to try to understand what is really bothering them, what it is that they're trying sure. to communicate. Sure. And um, we use the word abdominal pain but they may use the term belly or stomach. You could be even more stomach. precise and say epigastric. And when you say epigastric, I always think of the stomach. Okay. But uh, if That you don't might say not be it, good though. <laughs> if you don't say epigastric, <laughs> my whole theory about where that is is off. You've got so much small and large intestine that it's hard to know where the pain is referring from mm -hmm. to know what to call it. That's basically. There was a great book that came out about a hundred years ago. Oh, I know um, this book. I know Cope's Diagnosis say. of the Acute Abdomen. Oh, no, that's not the book I was well, thinking of. What book of. were you thinking of? I was thinking of the <laughs> other book that taught a common language for the entire elementary canal. And it was called With Gun and Camera Through the Elementary Canal. Okay. It, it was an anatomic small voyage through and they discovered all of the parts of the intestinal tract and everything else. Okay. It was a fun book and it was it was accurate. It was uh, anatomically accurate. I'm sorry. I, I no, no, no. <laughs> it just, well, that's perfect. That shows you the disconnect between the MD <laughs> and the non-MD. You that's say right. a great book a hundred years ago about <laughs> abdominal pain. Of course, it's Cope's diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what we all read? <laughs> right. I, I still actually have it. It's, it's a wonderful really? book. I recommend it. Um, but it serves to um, orient us to what is where in right. this particular part of the body. Right. Um, and when we say epigastric, um, a lot of times we break the belly, the abdomen, down into quadrants. Okay. Um, so we'll have a right upper quadrant, a right lower quadrant, a like left it. upper quadrant. I like left. it. And then when someone comes in and says that they have pain in their belly, abdomen, in their estomago, or whatever they Which choose quadrant? to call it, <laughs> right. we might ask. We might ask more specifically. Yeah. Well, where? Just point. Where? So this is you know. So yeah. the first thing we might ask when they come in is, you say you have pain, but where? Exactly. And this is so we ask where. What would be the next question about where? Might be when. And how much pain? We have the pain scale. And we have our, yeah, well, we can use our pain scale again. We can use a pain scale that we discuss in our musculoskeletal. How right. severe is That's the right. pain? And we have our, we could do our one through 10. We could get a sense of severity. That's going to help us too. So where's the pain? When do you get the pain? How long have you been having the pain? Exactly. How severe is the pain? All of the above. What makes the pain better or worse? Um, and like so many of our common complaints, the majority of the time, it's going to be a benign cause, okay. but we want to be careful that we recognize those times that require surgical interventions, sure. those times where, where it is much more serious and life-threatening. Exactly. And so those questions are going to help us a bit. Right. Um, there's a whole spectrum of specific diseases that fall under this Absolutely. umbrella. Absolutely. And our goal in this section is to 
to move those out so we address them independently and then to leave ourselves just with what are benign cases of abdominal pain where we can focus on symptoms and comfort um, but make sure that if they have a helminth infection a intestinal parasite that we pull that out and treat that accordingly right um, if they have a an obstruction that we pull that out sure if they have an abscess or intradominal infection that we address that um, gastritis or reflux with or without diarrhea with or without diarrhea because we've already covered that too. Um, so there should be a broad sure we start off with a very broad list of possibilities what yep. people call a differential diagnosis list That's right. and our goal is to get rid of all the life-threatening and uh, worrisome things and then so we're left with maybe people who are having intestinal spasms yeah. or constipation yeah. or something benign that we might want to uh, help them out with. I think so. Um, so abdominal pain, should we use you as the guinea pig in this? So we, have you ever had belly pain? What, what, what words do you use when your stomach or your abdomen or your belly hurts? Lower or upper GI is what I use. Interesting. Well, because I'm, you know, I used to work on a parasite that infects the small intestine, so I'm. So you try, you started I'm, to make that. Yeah, for myself. I mean, but yeah. I wouldn't describe that to a physician at all. I would just say that usually the major chief complaint would be diarrhea, okay, with or without pain. Okay. Sometimes, some events. Um, I mean, without getting too personal on this level. <laughs> okay. Um, acute constipation. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up. That was Because helpful. the act of defecation is something that virtually every human has to undergo at least once a day, sometimes twice. I say in New York City, sometimes we go three or four times. Why? Because we're good at it. <clears throat> that, that I used to lighten up the class that way. But what if you don't go? What if you took a long trip, like say, for instance, a transatlantic trip, which I'm prone to do sometimes, and the air in the airplane is very, very um, dry, and you tend to respirate and lose fluids. And when you do that, of course, the fluids are absorbed in your large intestine, and now you're not absorbing them, you're, you're res respiring them, so that the stool that you've produced is concentrated mm -hmm. and it tends to build up. And now you start angsting over, when is the next time I will defecate? And this is a horrible thing to think about for a person whose youth was pretty regular and mm -hmm. middle-aged adulthood was pretty regular. But as you start to get older and older, that becomes a primary focus of normality. If you can do that one little act every day, you still think you're okay. So that may not be true, of course, but, but that's the way you feel about it. So, so when I take these long trips, um, I very often have encountered that kind of problem. So I'm gonna, I am going to use you as a great example here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finally discerning my purpose And it, it's going to be a wonderful cultural example. <laughs> um, we often forget that we live within a culture. We do. We, we think, oh, when I go somewhere, they, they have these ideas. Um, but a couple of things I'll say. So we've, we've already hopefully moved past where we have, we're no longer worried. The person does not have warning signs. So they don't have a fever. They no. haven't lost weight. There's no. no blood in the stool. No. And now we feel like this is one of our benign issues. And constipation is one of the major causes. And um, as, you, as you bring up, uh, dehydration. Yeah. Can be, a, can be a cause of constipation. It's true. Lack of movement. You're sitting there in your, exactly. in your airplane, not moving around. So dehydration, lack of activity, these can lead to constipation. And you're eating, by the way. Um, but let me ask you to start off, <laughs> how often should you be having a bowel movement per Without day, per a week? Trip. A normal. Just what, what do you, cons what is the normal? For me, what is normal? Well, not for you. What is, no what is normal? Well, I don't think you can define it like that. So what is the normal range for the human population? We talked about temperature, right? We no said there's idea. a range. I can only speak for myself and my wife. And Don't speak normals, for your wife. You I might know. listen to these. <laughs> no, we have different, we have different rhythms. Uh, I'm a one-a-day person. Okay. 
And uh, usually it's in the morning, but sometimes it's in the okay. morning. But usually it's in the morning. So the re reason I bring this up is I, I want to actually give people ranges. Um, just like fever, what normal number of bowel movements, ah, right. it depends, right? It does It depend. depends on a couple things. Um, so one, it depends on your diet. Right. Strict vegetarians, they go to the bathroom less often. Do they? Meat eaters go to the bathroom more often. Really? And the amount of protein, and particularly animal proteins, in oh. your diet affects your frequency of bowel movements. Oh, interesting. And so it can range from um, a certain vegetarian on a low-calorie diet once a week really? up to three times a day. That's the, that's the normal bell curve. 90% of the population will go between once a week and three times a day. Right. Now, there's an interesting thing about, um, I'll say the United States, the culture of the United States. People, <laughs> I'm going to say over the age of 70 United States, which I think we might be including Dixon here, <laughs> is 60 years back, there was, I'll call it the castor oil movement. Oh. There was a belief that was That's promoted Yes. By, by physicians, by the medical industry, that you had to have a bowel movement every day That's right. for health. Correct. And if you didn't, you needed to make sure you did. This is all and true. I had a I had a great grandmother, wonderful woman. She taught me how to gamble and play cards <laughs> when I was and smoke and drink. When I was about five, I think. Um, not smoke and drink. <laughs> Tell off may color my, jokes. May my great grandmother rest in peace and not hear your comments. She was Irish. Um, we respect. Yes, she was Irish. Um, she was waiting for me to get older. Um, but Which she hasn't had, happened yet, but it's going to. But she actually had a surgery at one point, and after the surgery, she was given pain medications, and she uh. was constipated. And this was quite upsetting to her because I can for understand. health, you must I can have understand. your, your one bowel movement per day. So an interesting thing, when people travel, they may say, oh, normal for me is every day. But when you travel, when you drink less fluids, right. when you're less mobile, right. when your diet changes, right. this is all going to affect the frequency with which you have your bowel, bowel movements. Movement, and so I think that's one thing for people to realize is that constipation from a medical standpoint is not just that it changed a little from what you're used to. It's that it's outside the spectrum that it's causing discomfort. Exactly. And it can be uncomfortable to have a dry, potentially impacted um, amount of feces that you're not able to pass. And so we Easily. could almost- You could always almost, pass it, but it's not easy. We could almost <laughs> go backwards. So how do we prevent ourselves from getting constipated? We drink adequate amount of fluid which they almost never serve in economy fare class okay. airlines. In, in um, business class or first class, they'll ply you with bottles of champagne and as much water as you ever want to drink, but the, the regular passengers don't get that advert. So for most of you not traveling, you know, with, with Dixon on your airplanes across the Atlantic, <laughs> um, adequate hydration or Pacific. Yeah, adequate hydration is a great way of preventing. Absolutely. You have to ask and, for it, though. You have to ask for it. Well, forget about airplanes. Just in life. Oh, okay. fine, fine. <laughs> Just in life, most of our life will be spent not on airplanes. This is good. You want to make sure you stay hydrated. Yep. And a lot of people in the world do not drink enough water, right? They might drink their coffee. They might sure. have their champagne. I guess that's, that's right. What you're drinking sometimes. But they're not <laughs> drinking enough water, they're not staying hydrated, so that's important. The next is mobility. Yes. You want to stay active. You can't just sit there. Now, many people in the world, fortunately, don't have the luxury, and they're active just as part of their daily life. Yeah, that's um, right. So that's positive. Yep. But hydration, mobility. The next is diet. And your diet is going to actually affect your, your bowel movements. Vegetarian diets have certain benefits. Um, if you're going three times a day, you, you may be a very um, protein rich. You're, you're New Yorkers, I guess. Why do we do it three times a day? Because we eat too much meat, maybe? Because we're good at it. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what about um, one of the first things I often hear people say, oh, what I do to keep myself regular is there's a certain fruit that I like to eat to keep it's myself regular. Dried Have we had plums. That? Dried plums. So prunes. Are prunes a good idea? Well, I know that you're going to say no because I've already had this conversation <laughs> with you, but I still like them. I'm sorry. I like how they taste, actually. Um, what about apricots? So this is why I'm going to talk about prunes. 
Could, because the way prunes work, and they do work, is they're an irritant laxative. And the way they work is by irritating the colon. And that's not a great way to make your, your bowels move is by irritating the colon. Um, because over time, irritant laxatives can actually do damage to the colon. People can become laxative abusers, laxative dependent. Gotcha. And so we want to be careful. Gotcha. We want to avoid those. There are yeah, certain to. osmotic laxatives. If you're very careful in a slow introduction of fiber, then that can be helpful. If you throw fiber at a constipated person, they're going to become more constipated. You're not going to make this <laughs> yeah, better. This is true. This um, is true. So the idea is to get here early and give this as advice before someone becomes right. constipated. Right. Um, if, for instance, they're having spasms, which often happen, mm -hmm. then sometimes we'll actually recommend um, disoclamine, disoclamine, which is a, an antispasmodic, or hyoscyamine. These are things that are gonna actually relax when someone has just, we'll call it benign intestinal spasms. Oh. So there are definitely a lot of symptomatic things we can do, um, but the biggest one is gonna be fluid, diet adjustment, diet. and mobility. All of the above on an airplane are almost impossible. <laughs> you know, it's tough doing laps up and down the aisle on an airplane. So. Yeah, and you will notice when you travel, and um, perhaps this will be not just for patients, but for clinicians traveling to areas to provide care, is they might be on that airplane. That's right, exactly right. And so well, think of ways, are. maybe I'm... you're gonna bring an empty bottle that you can fill once you're through security. Yeah. So when you get there, you're not there having all these benign intestinal mm -hmm. spasms, constipation, bloating, and other issues. Yeah, no, no, I got it, got it. Good all advice, right. good advice. <laughs> all right, well, thank you for joining us, and hopefully you won't be suffering these common complaints. Right. See you on the next trip. Okay. <laughs>